Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Telescope Talk. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space, and it's been a while since we've gotten together and talked about telescopes. In particular, we're going to be talking with Kelly Beatty from... He's a senior editor at Sky and Telescope magazine. So this particular hangout means a lot to me because I love Sky and Tell. I grew up with it. It's been an important part of my life. Uh, if you don't know what Sky and Telescope is, you need to find out because it is one of the best magazines for amateur astronomies, the, the, the hobby of amateur astronomy. They've been around, well, a long time. We'll talk about that about, uh, with Kelly once I bring him up. I'm hoping everybody can hear me good and, and hear me fine. I am broadcasting, as I always do, on YouTube when I see people there showing up. I'm also on Periscope. If you guys want to use the Telescope Talk hashtag, I'm monitoring that on my tweet deck, so you can do that. Uh, I also, <clears throat> excuse me, on I'm on Twitch and uh, Facebook on the Deep Astronomy Facebook page. So uh, please leave me comments and questions on any of those platforms, and we'll talk about it with Kelly. Uh, I... What, like I said, this is a this is a topic that I'm. I ran into Kelly. I uh, introduced myself to him at NEF uh, a few months ago. This was in New Jersey, and uh, NEF is a. I always want to call it New England, but I think it's Northeast Amateur or Northeast Astronomy Forum. Is that right, Kelly? Right. It's uh, the yeah. largest astronomy trade show, if you want to call it that, anywhere right. in the world, as far as I know. Right, so Kelly was there, and I introduced myself at the Sky and Tell booth, and we got to talking, and I asked him to be on here. So let me bring him up. Uh, there he is. Hi, Kelly. Welcome. Hey, welcome. Indeed. <laughs> it's great to be here. Good. It's so happy to be talking to you. So you are the uh, senior editor for Sky and Telescope magazine. What does that mean? What does a senior editor do? It means I've survived. <laughs> 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 uh, honestly, Tony, I, I this past week, uh, July 22nd, I celebrated my 45th year. Wow. So you've been there since, oh, you just broke up. Oh, you froze up. Uh-oh. Hello? Oh, you're frozen in a... <laughs> in a nice smile, but it's still, <laughs> you're still froze up. Um, you might, if you can hear me, Kelly, you might want to come out of the video meeting and come back in again. Try that. Hello? Uh, huh. Well, it seems I'm still streaming, so I guess I'll, I will, I will fill this up a little bit. So <laughs> until up, oh, he, he exited. Okay. And as you can see, I've got this strange strange cut here so i'm i mean <laughs> until it joins me again i'm going to be in this weird window so i will do i'll, I'll uh, do like this um so anyway um uh sky and telescope magazine is has been around i think it started in 1940 and it started with uh, uh a gentleman named federer i forgot his first name now i was going to ask kelly that uh and it has been a publication that has served the amateur astronomy community uh, longer than anyone I I know of. I think it started out as uh, the it was either the Telescope or it started out as Sky Magazine, and there were two magazines back at the time, and then they merged into Sky and Telescope. But I'll let him tell that story uh, when he comes back. And uh, it's like I I grew up. I mean, I started the ama being an amateur astronomy community. Let me let me just do this real quick so it doesn't look so funny. Um, there. Okay, I started uh, in amateur astronomy when I was in high school in Boulder, Colorado in 1977, I guess is a good date. I was around there, it wasn't exactly then. Uh, and my first exposure to Sky and Tell was at the school district planetarium that they had there. Now, I was lucky when I went to high school that Boulder Valley School District actually had a planetarium, a school district sized planetarium that they allowed all the schools within the district to go to. And the director of that uh, planetarium, Jim Moravic, my mentor, uh, uh, allowed interns to go there. And I, uh, I was, a, I was one of the first interns in that program and I didn't know anything about amateur astronomy at that point, but he had telescopes all over the place. He had an old C8, he had old, uh, Cassegrain telescopes, not a, not a Schmidt Cassegrain, but a Cassegrain, a 10 inch Cassegrain reflector, uh, sitting there with no corrector plate. And it was, uh, an amazing program. And of course I, he had, uh, subscriptions. Ah, here we go. 
to both astronomy and sky and telescope. There he is. Hi, Kelly. So, so sorry about that. I, you know, I have a, this wonderful, awesome laptop, and for the first time in four years, I got the blue screen of death instantaneously, <laughs> just as I was starting to answer your question. That has never, ever happened. I apologize. That's no, okay. Sorry. We're used to it here at Deep Astronomy because my streaming <laughs> adventures, uh, my technical problems are world-renowned, so well, it's not a problem anyway, at all. We, we, were, we were talking about yeah. how... Uh, uh, my involvement in, in amateur astronomy. I mean, I, I literally started at Sky and Telescope 45 years ago, uh, and I think much of my life has been measured in, in Sky and Telescope epochs. Um, there was a point in my life when I had, had worked there um, for half of my life. And then there was a point where I had worked there for half of the magazine's existence. And then there was a later point when I had worked there longer than the founder of Sky and Telescope, Charlie Federer, who, who Charlie retired Federer. in 1973. So anyway, it, it, it has been uh, in my blood for a very, very long time. I, uh, I have always been interested in amateur astronomy ever since you know, I was a child, uh, definitely a child of the space age, the anniversary with Apollo 11 this past week. Uh, brought home a lot of my my childhood memories and and uh, and how I got my start. Yeah, I know. I, I, that was an amazing uh, that was an amazing week, wasn't it? I mean, I I I, I did a lot of traipsing through memory, down memory lane last week myself. And CBS did this broadcast where they well restreamed the entire mission, uh, their broadcast mission, and that was definitely a blast from the past i was uh seven years old when that happened but um yeah I, I remember watching it on television and staying up with dad and and uh seeing the moon landing and everything else so it was uh it was it was pretty incredible but when you cut out what i was telling them was that the i couldn't remember his first name but his name was charlie federer uh started the magazine or founded the magazine but it it started out first as the Sky Magazine, wasn't it? Or was it the it, Telescope Magazine? It, it was, was both. It, it was, was both. A, a magazine called The Sky. Uh, Charlie had been an, uh, a, a presenter at the Hayden Planetarium in New York City. And there they had started a little publication called The Sky. Charlie uh, was the editor and producer of that. And then meanwhile, out in Ohio, there was a, uh, one of the observatories out there had started a magazine called The Telescope. And uh, at one point, uh, Charlie and his wife met, um, oh shoot, I'm drawing a blank, the, the director of Harvard Observatory, who invited him to come up to Harvard and, and expand the sky into something bigger, something uh, more, you know, pan astronomy. And bring the telescope along with it and combine the two. So literally sky and telescope, unlike field and stream or car and driver, uh, started out as two distinct magazines that in 1941 saw their first joint publication. It was a very mom and pop of, uh, affair back then. Charlie and his wife, Helen, uh, operated out of a little cubby hole at Harvard Observatory that, that had been given them, uh, been given them to do this. It was kind of weird because it was definitely a for-profit undertaking in in the inside the walls of Harvard. So go figure that. And you know that the, the uh, World War II intervened and caused uh, a, a lot of uh, fall off uh, in all fronts of American recreational life, not just amateur astronomy. But after the war, Charlie and Helen it really kicked it into high gear. They started publishing it monthly um, uh, again and. Um, Boy, and you know, it is it is the granddaddy of amateur astronomy magazines. We're, uh, as I said, 1941, so we're coming up on our 80th year of continuous publication. Now, I don't know to what extent you want to talk about this, and if you can't, that's fine too, but I remember the period when, uh, I think it was the 90s, when Rick Feinberg was the, was the, was the um, what do you call it, the person in charge, editor-in-chief? Editor in chief. Yeah. Also, he was publisher at one point, but he actually was editor in chief for a long time. Yeah. Right, and then he went on to go to the AAS where he is now, right. and the magazine is now operated. If I if I if I remember the news, they bought Sky and Telescope, the American Astronomical Society. Is that right? Right. Right. So Sky and Telescope, for most of its history, was a, a mom, literally employee owned. Charlie and and the employees, me included, had shares of stock. We were a subchapter S corporation. Uh, situation changed in the mid 2000s, and and we were sort of obliged to sell to a conglomerate called New Track Media, which after a number of years again sold Sky and Telescope to an even bigger conglomerate called F and W Media, 
a publisher that specialized in hobby magazines, which of course we are. But we got lumped in with the likes of quilting magazines and hunting magazines and, and woodworking. And, you know, we're all of those. Amateur astronomers are do-it-yourselfers. <laughs> they really are. Right? <laughs> yeah. But, but we're also a news magazine. And we report on discoveries in astronomy. And, you know, not to diss quilting, but there aren't many discoveries made in the world of quilting. Certainly not on a daily basis. <laughs> Well, yeah, <laughs> we were always kind of the odd duck. In I guess I never thought of it that way. <laughs> and last March, F and W, uh, having struggled as many publishers have with uh, declining uh, the circulations and advertising revenue, filed for bankruptcy, and we were part of that. So we were going to have a new owner come uh, the end of June, and fortunately, the 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 bidder that that, that took home the prize in my mind was the American Astronomical Society an organization of professional astronomers that has as one of its fundamental uh, objectives and mandates to further astronomy through outreach to amateur astronomers. And in fact, they, a couple of years ago, the AAS created an amateur astronomer membership category. So this was a match made in heaven. We are so thrilled to be under the wing of the AAS. Uh, it will be, you know, it's pretty much going to be business as usual for the magazine. They've kind of spun us off as a separate standalone entity. There's not a whole lot of talk of meddling in any way, except to give us, us the stability to continue for maybe another 75 years. Well, does the connect? By, the, the viewers of these hangouts are very familiar with the AAS because they sponsored for two years the uh, Astro Coffee hangouts that we did here uh, in that same spirit of astronomy outreach and communication. And for two years, they sponsored and endorsed these hangouts, and they still endorse these hangouts, but they they don't have the we don't have the financial backing we used to because of the the the, the budget uh, constraints they have there. But so people are very familiar with the AAS and what the Astronomical Society is doing. But do you feel like you're kind of coming home though, just a little bit? with that connection with Rick Feinberg or is he not really involved because I know he does I'm not quite sure what his role is at the AA I think he's the uh, he, news he's the press officer the press uh, officer and, that's right right and and it, it was Rick let's just say that Rick had <laughs> uh, a, a significant role as matchmaker here good uh, connecting us with with Kevin Marvel who's the uh, sort of the executive director of the AAS that's right and you know in, in our mind it was like like, where were you guys 15 years ago when we first sold the magazine? It would have been perfect then as it is perfect now. I mean, one of the things that we see happening, Sky and Telescope has always been a fairly authoritative voice uh, for amateur astronomy. And, you know, in the internet era, there are a lot of other authoritative voices. I can think of, uh, you know, space.com and even NASA itself uh, pump out lots of good information about observing the sky. And, you know, we feel that we, that's sort of our turf. And, uh, and we think that now with this sort of waving the flag of the AAS, having that as part of our imprimatur, to use a fancy word, that uh, we think we're going to be you know, much more a voice and a force uh, to be listened to and reckoned with in the arena, not just of amateur astronomy, but in the popularization of astronomy in general. Right. And, but I have to say, even though you are primarily a print magazine, your online presence is really quite good. Um, your website is extremely, uh, up to date. It's helpful. It's got lots of good stuff on it. If you guys don't know, it's, it's sky and telescope. I think it's just sky and tell, isn't it? Or it's sky and telescope all spelled out and smooshed together. In one word. Uh, not an ampersand, the word A-N-D, skyandtelescope.com. Right, and I have a bookmark, that's why. <laughs> so I, I, but you go there, and, they, and right there, there's, 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 you know, there's what's up tonight, there's the latest articles, and, and all kinds of really, if there's news or something that's happened, you guys are right on top of it. In fact, <laughs> just before, just leading up to this, uh, this hangout, you were getting a call from somebody locally about a, uh, a, 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 a fireball, I guess, that had happened near, near Boston. So you guys are the on the front lines of stuff like this, where people call you first to find that, out. That's right. What's and going in fact, on. we have we have an awesome staff uh, that has, you know, it's not the staff of fifteen people that we had uh, uh, two decades ago, and during the fat years of advertising and the internet was just getting started. But we have we have three PhDs on our staff. And, uh, and, and, you know, we, we have, we can write with an authority that few other publications can. We, 
for example, when when a, a scientific result is published in some professional journal, and and that um, the the lead organization for the chief uh, the principal author, say it's NASA or the University of California or Harvard or whatever it might be, they put out a press release, and lots of other venues just take that press release and put it up and say, here's you know here's the latest on this discovery. We don't do that. We start from scratch. We, we often we don't even read the press releases, honestly. We'll go to the original paper, digest what's there, call in other experts as we need to, draw on our own knowledge, uh, and, and put out something that's authoritative and timely and digs a lot deeper, gets behind the scenes of, uh, and gives historical context. That's really important of all of these discoveries. It's something I'm really proud of. It's something we've done very, very well and, it, and probably better than anybody else for all of these decades. And we'll continue to do that. So what do you feel uh, is in the context of the hobby of amateur astronomy and all of your years working at Sky and Telescope, uh, what do you feel like, how has the hobby changed in your opinion over, uh, over the decades? I mean, what, what, what would you say would be some of the mo the bigger changes that you've noticed over the course of your career? Sure. So, so when Tony, when you and I were getting into this game, we were young people, right? We were. Yeah. Uh, I was in, in high in, school. Yeah. Yeah, in our teens, and and actually, in those days, Sky and Telescope was in the libraries of many high schools. Uh, it, the our our competition, uh, Astronomy Magazine, hadn't been invented yet, and so we kind of owned that space so to speak. Um, and many of the new subscribers that we got uh, came from those ranks of, of you know, adolescent, uh, eager, ready to, they've gotten their first telescope, they want to know what to do with it, and, and, and they came to us for, for that information. What's happened since then is, on a couple of fronts, you know, Lots of, as I mentioned earlier, lots of good astronomical information exists on the internet. You can, and it's it's very timely. You can find out whether the space station is passing overhead tonight. You can find out where the moon and planets are, or download a a a program that quite easily replicates what your night sky will look like on your computer screen or on your phone, even. Um, and so that's that's our current competition. And what we're finding is that although we have, you know, gained and lost a lot of subscribers over the years, we're, we're very stable now. We're still a presence. Um, we're finding that our new subscribers are no longer teenagers. They're 40-somethings. And so if you imagine, we'll, we'll find someone who has, you know, they've reached a point in their life where their kids are off at college. They're finally empty nesters. They remember how much fun they had with astronomy when they were young. They've got uh, t lots of free time now and disposable income to invest in in getting back into astronomy, and that's that's when they come to us. A lot of them see us online first, and then and then subscribe to the magazine. It remains Sky and Telescope. The print version remains the sort of essential guide from soup to nuts, having to do with astronomy, whatever form it might take. Uh, our cover story in our latest issue is this. Uh, you know, this image of the supermassive black hole uh, that was released and, and the story behind that. As the Event only Horizon the Telescope, telescope right? right? Yeah, the Event Horizon right. Telescope. And then you flip later on and, and it talks about the Perseid meteor shower. And you flip later on and there's a review of a new piece of astronomical gear, a telescope that uh, that is all the rage in, in, uh, in, in online circles. So, we continue to be that sort of encyclopedic approach to amateur astronomy and still very relevant. What, what I find is that in, in general, our readers are a lot older than they used to be. Uh, and you see this reflected in amateur astronomy clubs as well. It's a graying population. And, and we've kind of uh, accommodated that in the sense that you know, science and the science of discovery and the discovery of new things in astronomy never grows old. You're always excited to learn about something new that's happened on Mars. Uh, the, the, the headline today that we got was that maybe in the distant past, there was an ocean on Mars and there were tsunamis in that ocean that left their marks as sort of wave uh, shorelines uh, on, the, on the Martian landscape. So discoveries like that are being made all the time. And, and I think that our readership, regardless of age, is always interested in finding out about that. 
Are they still spending all nighters, you know, observing and logging Perseid meteors? I don't think so. But they're still going to solar eclipses. You know, they're still using their telescopes to amaze their friends and family with what's going on in the night sky. And I think for those reasons, our, our readership always re uh, appreciates what we present and, and will be relatively loyal to us and will be there uh, in the years to come. Well, Uncle Bill on Twitch is commenting, it's the blend of professional science and amateur how-to uh, that makes S&T one of a kind, in my opinion. And that's a good, that's a good observation. Uh, that, Thank you for that, Bill. Uh, that's the way we feel as well. Uh, you know, there, uh, as with lots of things on the Internet, there are plenty of places to go for information. But we, we want to be the place to go where we know we'll get it right uh, and, and you'll, you'll be able to depend on what we, we do. Um, it, it's funny, I, that you mentioned that interview with the local here in the Boston area with one of the local radio stations. I do a lot of interviews and I don't do it because I'm ego driven. I'm past that point. You oh, know, yeah, I'm mostly I know. retired <laughs> now, right? Yeah. What, what I want to do is I want to make sure that the information that gets out there is right, is correct, and is not oversold. Uh, and is and is still you know conveyed with the excitement and passion that I feel for this material, uh, but but in a way that's grounded in reality. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, and there's a lot I want to talk with you about in regard to that. But with with respect to but with respect to the point you were making about the aging of the hobby, one that that's something that I have a couple of theories about. And I want to get your thoughts on this. First of all, I live in Daytona Beach or near Daytona Beach, where biking, uh, motorcycling, is a big thing. Uh, Harley Davidsons, that kind, they have a lot of bike weeks, things like that. And I'm noticing that <laughs> most of the people while riding around on Harleys are really old guys, right? And I'm hearing that younger people aren't getting into the into motorcycle riding as much as, as as they used to so that's another example of a hobby that is is aging and i worried about that with amateur astronomy but i i don't think it actually is aging as much as uh as we think because first of all there, there are more barriers i think into getting into the hobby now than there were when i was in high school and as an example i was telling the story while you were getting your video uh sorted that the um I was lucky in high school that I went to a school district in Boulder, Colorado that had a school district planetarium and actually had a science department with telescopes in it that were made available to me as a student. And I could not afford a C8. I could not afford anything. But they had an, an old Criterion RV6. They had a 10-inch Cassegrain reflector, not a Schmidt cast, but a Cassegrain. Uh, they had a... Um, they had a C8 and other things that you could check out. I had resources available to me as a, as a high school student that I don't think many high school students have today. And that is a one barrier, okay? That doesn't preclude their interest. Of course, kids are still interested in space and astronomy, uh, but that's one thing. Another thing that might prevent them from being a, I don't know how you would, what would you call it, an active amateur astronomer, sure. uh, would, yeah, be, would, be, uh, would be that lifestyles have changed. So we all, we're all, career driven we have to follow this path where we get a job and and you're right the barrier to entry to some of this equipment is such that you need you need disposable income to be able to make this work i mean if you want a decent telescope with a halfway decent camera you're looking at maybe 2500 to five five thousand dollars if you wanted to buy something high end uh, you don't have to spend that much but you know that is it is a bit up there uh, so that may be another another thing that prevents people from getting into the hobby earlier however one of the things that sky and telescope is doing is that's not all they do they don't just talk about equipment they don't just give reviews on eyepieces they don't just tell you what the hot products are for 2019 they also give you like you said these in-depth analyses of discoveries which anybody can learn about so so that i think is a is a vital service that you're performing and on that point i want to ask you about the quality of information that's out there one of the oh. things that worries me as a, as a science communicator is I worry about the, the level of distrust that I see in science today. When I do a Space Fan News video or when I do a vlog post or I write an article, I get a, I've noticed that there's a lot of pushback, a lot of uh, distrust of the actual information that's being conveyed. The growth of things like the Flat Earth Society, the growth of th people who think that there is a planet the size of Neptune 
called Nibiru that's being hidden from us by NASA. These, this kind of thinking seems to be on the increase. And I wanted to get your thoughts on this because you're committed to quality information. Have you also seen this? Or is it just because I'm, in, I'm on YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> no, no it's, it's something we all endure. Uh, and, you know, it starts from... Um, not just a general distrust of science, but a general dismiss, being dismissive of science. Uh, there are always going to be kids who aspire to be, you know, engineers and scientists and astronomers. But fewer and fewer people, uh, as they go through their educational, uh, uh, you know, arc, uh, feel that science is something that that they're attracted to or that they feel is important. Um, I gave a, I used to give a talk called Where Are the Young Astronomers? And uh, one of the things about it is, as you point out, uh, scientists as a rule are just not as highly regarded as they used to be, and, and the science is suspect. We certainly see that in debates about uh, climate change and global warming, and we see it in astronomy, too. It's, it's so easy for someone to say, uh, oh, you know, there was that bright light in the sky. I wonder if we were being invaded by aliens that night. Uh, and, and you know, Carl Sagan, uh, who I knew uh, pretty well, uh, had, oh, that's had, awesome. wrote, wrote a book called uh, The Demon Haunted World. Yeah, it's one of his best. I have it. Uh, science as a light, as a candle in the darkness. Yep. I, I, and, you know, he one of the things he talks about in there is like alien abductions and how easily we are have become to believe in something that's extreme as an as a, an explanation for something like Nibiru, you know, this this hidden planet. And and who is promulgating this? Well, they're they're people who, I don't know, their their motivations are suspect, but they're certainly not scientifically grounded. And that and that people would believe them instead of NASA, and in fact would flip it and say, well, NASA actually knows the truth, but they're keeping it secret. Right. It's just it's just bonkers to me um and one of the things that that uh sagan pointed out in this book is that you know if if people hear enough uh so-called incidents verified incidents of alien abductions they're going to tend to believe that they're actually real and and i i, I really encourage everyone to dig up this book and read it because it, it's so it, it's not really about astronomy it's about scientific um authenticity and and veracity and uh uh it's it's role in our society uh, one of the things that sagan said it sticks in my mind is that you know extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence right that's become part and, of our vernacular now right yeah. and and so if i if i'm an alien and i want to make my presence known on the earth i am not going to land in rural vermont and stop some farmer you know, uh, who's out harvesting and abduct him on my spaceship and expect him to be a credible uh, emissary on, on the fact that I have arrived here. I'm going to do like in uh, in that classic science fiction movie, The Day the Earth Stood Still, where the alien is smart enough. They're smart enough to get to Earth. And then they're smart enough to land on the mall in Washington, D.C. to get the biggest bang for their buck. And so, uh, you know, that to me is is sort of en uh, endemic of the of the kind of nonsense that we get uh, in listening. I, I spend a lot of time working with reporters and with, with um, you know, like network television. Network television used to have a person on their staff who was the science reporter or an entire team. CNN at one point had an entire science team. Daily newspapers had science sections that ran weekly or more often in the New York Times and the L.A. Times and the Boston Globe and all the major newspapers had science sections. And it's devolved because, you know what, people don't want to listen to that anymore. They'd rather uh, walk away with their preconceived notions and not listen to, to they're, they're not being, um, they're not being judicious they're not being critical of the facts that they hear and challenge things that don't make sense to them. And I think that's the root of the, the evil that we're facing here. I couldn't. Oh, that was very well said. Now, I got up for a second 
while you were talking, so I didn't hear everything you said uh, because I went to get this off my bookshelf. There, here's the book he's talking about uh, because uh, it was being uh, Diane from New York on uh, Periscope wanted to see the title. It's uh, The Demon Haunted World, Science is a Candle in the Dark. I believe it's still available on Amazon. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great book. Yeah. And, and, you know, I... I, 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 I just, as I, you know, the older I get, the, the more, the more nonsense I see online, certainly. Um, uh, I, every year I go to the annual meeting of the, uh, broadcast meteorologists, uh, the, the, the people who bring you weather on television. That's and an interesting radio. meeting for you to go to. <laughs> and, and, and what I do for them is, um, I, I give them a sort of 15 minute rundown all, all the interesting things astronomically that are going to be happening in the coming six months to a year. Because think about this on in your everyday, you know, local TV station, the meteorologists there are likely the only people on the TV staff uh, with any kind of scientific training. And they're actually seen as sort of station scientists. So if there's a big news yeah. story involving not just weather stuff like tornadoes, but, but a, a volcano meteor. erupting or a, or a tidal wave or something like that, it's usually the meteorologists that, that get tasked to sort of explain that. Right. They certainly are in the middle of the, the whole global warming controversy. And a lot of them uh, are taking a lot of heat from their viewers. But one thing they don't take heat for is is pointing out things that are astronomical. They always get a tremendous amount of positive feedback uh, whenever they talk about, you know, there's going to be a great space station pass tonight. Or if you go out, you'll see Venus right next to the <laughs> right next to the crescent moon. It's it's uh, it's it's very popular. And so they really lap that up. And, and these people are on these meteorologists. You know, they see it much more than I do. They have usually blogs and, and uh, chat sessions or, or a, a social media presence, and they get all kinds of people attacking them for, you know, their positions on just everyday science things. Uh, the flat earth is the most benign of the lot. You know, there's this thing called chemtrails. I don't know if you've heard about this one. No. That the government is, is you know, secretly poisoning us with uh, overflights uh, that that are dropping chemicals. Oh into the yeah, sky. yeah, I've heard. So, yeah, so uh, heard I'm sure stuff. you'll get a few comments about that. Um, <laughs> so, but but that and and global warming, you know. So there, there, the National Science Foundation every year does a sort of survey of American adults, which is called Science Indicators. And as long ago as 20 years, this is not an overnight thing, there was a tipping point at which most Americans uh, didn't know, <coughs> that, for example, that Earth goes around the sun in 365 days. Right. Many people still believe that the sun goes around the Earth. And, and you know, our grandparents and their and the generations before were much more aware of what's going on in the night sky than we are as a rule, right? Because we don't, we as a, as a society just don't spend that much time outside at night anymore. No. Uh, and often the, the night that we see is compromised by light pollution. Um, but in any case, we, we, you know, we rely on our apps to show us what we're looking at as opposed to actually learning. That's right. And, uh, uh, the, the, I just want to mention, cause I'm watching the chat here. This book is, was really good at, uh, uh, it basically was Carl Sagan describing what science is, what it can and right. can't do, uh, and it, it's very, it's an, it's a definitely uh, a very good, interesting reading. Well, I, so I just, w I just wanted to comment on your what you just said because I have a theory. You said it started about twenty years ago when you could that we reached kind of a tipping point where people didn't know a lot of basic things about the sky. A lot of people still don't know what causes the seasons. If you ask them what causes that, they, right. they a lot of people can't answer that question because, in part, because we don't look up. But it's also I think we've become. Uh, more distrustful of science for a lot of reasons. It's a huge topic. I won't go into all of it, but my theory goes that it's it, that it, it started around the time of the atomic bomb after during World War II, where people realized what science could be quite scary, and then we what comes along with other with the fantastic successes that science has had over the with uh, with its discoveries and with the technology that followed those discoveries that came out of it um, there were a lot of things that were very scary things that we that science allowed us to do that maybe we shouldn't be allowed to do and so we were 
the moral quandary comes up, like, you know, think just because we can do abortion, should we? Just because we can do gene editing, should we? Uh, the, these kinds of things raise real moral uh, dilemmas that are hard to think about. Uh, and so you think you start to get scared of science a little bit, but then along comes social media, where now we can group up into our little tribes and build up a community of people who believe certain things. One of them is that the Earth is flat. The other is that NASA faked the moon landing. Uh, the other is that global warming is a hoax. All of these things we can group around now on social media and amplify. And, and, then, when you, and then when you join that group, that's the only message you hear. That's right. And you're these part people, of a community these, now. These People are not going to some general watering hole to to air to where all sides are discussed uh, because, like so much of what's happening these days, it becomes polarized very quickly, and, and you don't like to be shouted down. So you go someplace else where people are thinking the same way you are. Yeah. But in the uh, as a consequence of that, you don't actually hear what the research is, what what the the evidence is for or against a particular position. Right, and you end up. Uh, sort of feeding on this bubble and you've but 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 I think it's something a little more important has happened here Kelly and that is that you've become a part of a community where you're accepted for your either for your for your views on whatever it might be in this let's, let's just use flat earth for, for a moment I think that kind of was it's always been around but it kind of waned a bit and now it's gotten ex exploded in 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 our in our uh popular imaginations because of this i think effect where we now they can get together on social media and in conventions and stuff and really just sort of reinforce each other's viewpoints but now you're never gonna go up to someone who believes that the earth is flat and convince them of anything using a rational argument because if they were to accept what you said they they have an emotional invested interest in this community now and you're asking them to reject this community, who will then reject them if they believe what you say. So there's a vested interest in not leaving this community, and they don't really want to hear what the actual truth is. They, they, that, and you're not going to convince them if you if you try. So that to me is dangerous because now you're you've got tribes essentially running around doing things. Now, can the flat Earth? belief do any harm i don't see how uh, maybe it can but i mean it's it seems harmless it's, enough it's more comical i mean the flat earth got a, a boost because uh an nba basketball store kyrie irving yeah uh who plays for boston celtics or used to anyway uh was you know was in that camp and so suddenly it got a lot of visibility and and legitimacy if you want to call it legitimacy because this this high profile person is is espousing that uh, position you know and i and i think i think that that you you're in general if we can swing this back to astronomy yes let's do <laughs> sorry really are, there really aren't that many like uh entrenched uh misconceptions about astronomy uh, Nibiru is one that's kind of waned. The, this notion that somehow there were, there's this giant planet that 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 we know exists, uh, but NASA has been keeping it a secret from us. Um, uh, there is, you know, uh, whether there's um, life elsewhere. The face on Mars was a really good case in point where there was a, a geological feature, basically a, a, an eroded mesa on Mars. That in early Viking images from the 1970s, 70s, yeah, uh, was lit in such a way that it looked at like you know kind of a helmeted human face. Yeah, how the aliens knew all those years ago had telescopes so powerful that they knew exactly what Earthlings Earthlings looked like, and uh, and had carved a, a mountain in our uh, uh, essence, you know, to, before to we even existed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, because now I think there, it's pretty easy to bring to bear uh, even amateur uh, amateur astronomers can bring to bear information that is that is cogent. The, a really good one is getting back to UFOs for a second. You know, we, 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 you, if you look to see who offers up reports of UFOs, uh, and the people who are most passionate about them, again, Carl Sagan handles this in, in, uh, in his Demon Haunted World book, you know, they are not, we, us, amateur astronomers who spend hours and hours and hours, you know, every month 
outside at all hours of the night under a dark night sky and know what we're looking at. If, if anybody, if, if there was any credibility to UFO reports, then the people at the top of the list of reporting would be amateur astronomers. And guess what? They're not. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's an excellent point. Yeah. So I, I, I want to get your thoughts. Oh, wait, let me just read Andrew Planet's question. Uh, didn't we have a hangout once in which we agreed that it is better to have flat earthers learn some science, even if it's pseudo, than none at all? Maybe we ought to think of them as science agnostics. I don't know about that. I, no, to answer your question, Andrew, no, we did not have a hangout on that. I've never said that I think it's better to know pseudoscience than, uh, well, than no science well, at all. But You know, it, it speaks to not just the science itself, but the scientific method. You know, the stuff that Galileo did to prove or disprove what had been long-held notions. Uh, you know, if I drop a feather and a cannonball from the top of a of uh, the, the Lean Tower of Pisa, yeah, the cannonball is going to fall faster, but not because it weighs more. Um, and, and so I, I think where the flat earthers fall short is they are not willing to embrace all the observational evidence and then come to some logical conclusion about it. Right. The notion of you put forward a hypothesis, then you conceive the observational tests that you need to prove or disprove that hypothesis. That's how things work. The analogy I use is that uh, you're driving along in your car and you hear something go, you know, thump, 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 thump under your hood. And you want to try to understand what the problem is with your car. So what do you do? Well, you speed up or slow down. You shift into a different gear. Maybe you, you shift into neutral and let the car coast and see if, the, if it changes. You're, you're actually, you have a hypothesis, right, that there's something wrong with your engine. And, and you go through a set of observations to try to figure out what that is. That's, that's what science is all about. And in the end, it turns out you just ran over a stick and it's caught up in your, you know, your, uh, your, your, your uh, suspension and it, it's no problem with your car at all. But yeah. the, you know, this, sci this notion of, of having confidence in the scientific method, you know, I think, is at the root cause of a lot of the misconceptions that, are, that happen in science, the, the uh, strange uh, ideas that people come up with, and, and also the inability to accept as valid observations from professionals who are in a position to make those observations such as nasa scientists for example right and there is an additional issue where we you know that some of these scientists are a bit sensational themselves and might aggrandize their findings or whatever in ways that are a little bit disingenuous but that's a minority that's a very small minority um let me get to superluminal's question because it's uh it's, it's a great one for you and i'd like to get your thoughts on it he is asking do you think that younger people are getting more into astrophotography than visual astronomy Ah, uh, I think the answer is yes, um, because it's now so easy to get quality astrophotos. Oh, God. Even from something as simple as your smartphone. A lot of smartphones have, yep. have the uh, adapters night, on them. Nighttime settings. You can buy telephoto lenses for your smartphones. Uh, it's funny, I taught astronomy for, for a few years at a high school, uh, a private high school, and in a class of 20, there might have been one or two kids whose family, whose entire family had a real camera apart from a smartphone uh, in their household. And so, um, uh, you know, most everybody today, they, they take their pictures with a smartphone. That said, now you can go out and buy, you know, a two or three hundred dollar a uh, higher end camera, even a point and shoot camera or a, a, what we call a, a DSLR or something with, you know, interchangeable lenses, you stick it on a tripod and uh, the, the sensitivity is so good now with the detectors that you can take beautiful nightscapes with a single 30 second exposure, something that would have taken hours and hours and hours uh, two or three decades ago. Tell and I'm going to give, I'm gonna give your, those of you who've tuned in and are listening, I'm going to give you a great tip. Um, the next time there's a full moon in the sky, go outside your house, set your camera, even your cell phone camera on a tripod uh, and take an exposure. Now the camera will automatically just use a standard 
you know, automatic exposure. And the camera will automatically take an exposure long enough to make uh, things look bright. And since the moon is reflected sunlight, your house and the trees and everything will look like daylight, even though you've taken it in the middle of the night. And the one thing that will be different is up in that blue sky, there will be stars. And it's, it's just a really amazing, freaky, and trivially easy kind of night sky photography to do. Oh, yeah, definitely go out and give that a shot, guys. That sounds like I may do that too, but just to, just to play around with it. <laughs> well, I would like to get your thoughts on something else that uh, it, it affects amateur astronomy, and I want to get your ideas on this because I'm a little worried about it. I know it's a little early in the game to talk about it, but I did a video last week where I... I, the, the title of the video was, Is Elon Musk Ruining Our Night Sky? And it had to do with, yes, I know, it's a little bit sensational title, but uh, the, the, the story was about the Starlink network of satellites that SpaceX is, is planning on, they want to put up in orbit. Some, if they get approval for all of it, by the time they're done, there'll be 12,000 satellites in orbit in low Earth orbit, about 550 kilometers above the Earth blanketing the globe so that we can have internet access across the globe. A great goal, one that I support, but I, astronomers are worrying uh, that perhaps this might be too many, that they're going to be, not only, it's not just that there's 12,000 of them because there's a half a million pieces of things up in the in orbit and space junk and, and other things around in orbit of, of, over the earth. So, but these are going to be 12,000 very bright, very reflective satellites. Are you worried about stuff like this at all, ruining our ability to... I mean, the night sky is already, as I view it, a precious nat nat natural resource that has already succumbed to light pollution right. in everywhere. There's few select places that you can get a nice night dark sky. And this might ruin that. What are your thoughts on that? Is okay, it something so, I shouldn't worry about? Well, okay. So uh, for those who are, who are coming, this is a project called Starlink. Right. And you know what? He's not the only one. No. Nor is, nor is the United States the only country who's considering doing that. That's right. There's Amazon. They're, they want to put yeah. 3,000 up. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of companies. So, so the you know, one of the things we have going up for us is the inverse square rule, which is that in order for these satellites to have a strong radio connection with the ground, they have to be in relatively low orbits. And uh, they're, they're moving in orbits... That's, you know, the notion of this, this super constellation of satellites has evolved over time. Originally, Musk was going to have them in somewhat higher orbits, uh, and, and because they're higher up, they, are, they will be not as obvious. Uh, he did a test launch of 60 of them just a, a month or two ago. That's right, the last Falcon Heavy. And, and, you know, when they were initially launched, they were in, they were still in a sort of deployment conga line that marched across the sky in a very low orbit, and, and they were quite obvious, quite obvious to the eye. But what's going to happen over time is that e this, the, the plan is to have several layers of these satellites at different altitudes above above the Earth, and the lowest level ones will, in fact, be at that relatively low orbit. And, and the reason that they're so low is that uh, they will they will naturally they're they're low enough that the atmosphere is going to drag them down, and they'll they'll naturally re-enter over time and be constantly replenished. But another consequence of that is that because they're in such low orbits. You know, guess what? Satellites do not have really bright lights on them, like Musk erroneously said the space station does. He, he know he, yeah. he, he. I think he he was probably taken aback by the backlash that he got from the astronomical community about this. He was. I think you're right. Yeah. And and so I think he's going to take some some uh, you know modifications that will make them less obvious. So you said they're very bright and very reflective. Maybe they won't be so reflective. Maybe they'll be painted black or something like that. Right. But, but the other thing is that in these low orbits where they would be most obvious to us, they have to be in sunlight and you have to be in darkness in order for them to be visible in your sky. And what that means is that necessarily most of them, not all of them, but most of them will only be visible in the hour or two after sunset or before dawn when, when ordinarily we see a lot of satellites. In the middle of the night, I don't expect it to be nearly as bad. Now, don't take this as being an apologist for, for Starlink. 
clearly they're going to be a problem not because of visual astronomy. They're going to be a problem for professional astronomy. Right. Uh, people who are trying to, you know, not, not everyone has the vantage point of the Hubble Space Telescope, which will be above the altitude of most of these satellites. We here on the ground trying to take pretty nightscapes of the Orion Nebula, you know, or something like that, uh, they're going to be crossing our, our, our field of view. And yes, there is software that you can erase that and, and, you know, you can add images and it won't be as much of a problem. But, but there is this concern for professional visual optical astronomy and also radio. Radio, astronomy, good. I'm glad you said that, yes. Right, because they're going to be basically irradiating the Earth from all directions at all times, day and night, even though they might not be visible to eye. They're still up there. They're still going to be up there. And there are, you know, there are, they're going to take huge swaths of the radio uh, band uh, in, order to, in order to do this communication. So right. I think there's cause for worry. And I, I, and I honestly, there are five United Nations space treaties. None of them cover how many satellites you can launch. That's right. Right. And, and so there, this is this is it's an open ended question that that I think we we're just going to have to see how this plays out. Um, at, like many things, it might be that the, the very most challenging astronomy that we're going to want to do to make the best discoveries may have to resort to being away from the Earth, be it a Webb telescope or a Hubble telescope or on the far side of the moon or someplace that's untainted by the, the everyday concerns. You know, bringing worldwide internet is an incredibly laudable goal. Yes. And, and there's only one way to do it, and it's the way that Musk is proceeding about it. Now, I think the challenge for him and his company is to be, you know, to be uh, considerate of the various stakeholders here, and find ways to make his little, you know, uh, small satellites and their solar panels, because they're all going to be powered by solar uh, power, to be as innocuous uh, in our night sky as possible. Right, but and, and I don't hold any illusions that he plans to do this for, you know, uh, altruistic reasons. I'm sure that there's a lot of other. Uh, motivations going on. He's got to make money. And so this is definitely going to be a, a profit making venture. So um, I do a lot of the goal. I think it's a good goal, but I also worry about the same thing that you do because astronomy, if you say that sooner or later, the only kind of meaningful astronomy we're ever going to get done is in space. I think that's a, I think that's a catastrophe because if you look at the on the upcoming ground based observatories and what they're going to be doing from things like the TMT, if it gets built, to the LSST when it comes online. All of these ground-based observatories, have they do vital surveys and, and right. telescopes, space right. telescopes, aren't ideally right. suited for sky surveys unless they're of a certain wavelength, like the X-ray telescopes and things like that. So I worry if that comment about, well, we may just have to resign ourselves to doing professional astronomy from space or maybe on the, the, the far side of the moon, whatever it is, that that would be a catastrophe, I think. For well, astronomy. you know, you, you asked me a little while ago, uh, which is easier now to get into photography or visual observing. I, you know, I will take a Starlink Armada if I can only get rid of light pollution. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Right? If that's a choice, sure. <laughs> right. I, and I think the greater danger to the future of us being able to look at the night sky is in fact light pollution and i need to put in a plug for the international dark sky association sure. yep. ida its website is darksky.org i have been intimately involved i was on the board for for more than a decade i am a dark sky warrior um and and you know we are we are trying to beat back uh the 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 rampant increase in the amount of illumination that we have in our night sky and we're, we're, we're seeing some some battles won uh, but you know what we're just we have more and ever more lights and yeah. and the, the challenge is going to be uh, to to rein those in in a way that that reduces the amount of light pollution I'll give you a good case in point those of you who might be in your hometown, uh, and your town might be considering putting in LED street lights. And I'll guarantee you, if you don't have them now, in five years you will. Right. And and there are choices that you can make. LEDs can be good, bad, or ugly. And the ugly side is that if they give off a, a light that has too much blue, too many uh, too many blue photons in it. Uh, in in the parlance, it's a high color temperature, four or five thousand degrees Kelvin. These are it's like a cheap LED flashlight. It actually looks blue. And guess what? Guess which portion of the wavelength 
creates the most light pollution. It's the blue light end. Guess which portion of the wavelength is most disruptive to the nocturnal environment? It's the blue wavelengths. Guess which portion of the spectrum is most disruptive to your sleep cycle when you're trying to get to sleep the blue. Uh, and, and, yeah. and you know maintain circadian rhythm? It's the blue part of the wavelength. Plus the fact that there's just too much light. So, so I would, if you if you are facing uh, the conversion of your street lights to LEDs, there are ways to do it with a lot of intelligence. And you know you can't blame the the local administrators and, and government officials because they just don't know. They're not educated. It's not like they're intentionally trying to screw up the night sky for us. They just need a little education. Right. So. So go to the IDA, call me, kbd at darksky.org is the, the email to reach me at. And, uh, you know, I'll put you in touch with someone who can help you help them uh, make the right decision on lighting. That's a great point. And it is a solvable problem because I, were, I lived in Alamogordo, New Mexico, which is near the Sacramento Peak Mountains. And they there's that's where Apache Point is, which they did the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And to support the astronomy there, uh, the entire city has full cutoff light fixtures that face down to the ground and they don't shine up into the sky. And they're sodium vapor, I believe, which can be filtered. Uh, so the whole right. the whole city at night is like yellow, <laughs> and, it's, and it's it's and, really cool. And you know the advantage of LEDs over those sodium vapor lights is that sodium vapor lights don't like to be turned on and off or dimmed. Right. They're on once they come on, they're on all night. LEDs can be dimmed, they can be turned on and off, they can be controlled with a computer network. And so there are many many advantages if it's done intelligently. We literally, you know, the, this conversion to LEDs is a once in a multi generational change in the way we light our nighttime environment. And because these LEDs last for decades, it's going to be a while before we have a chance to influence these these outcomes again as we do right now. So now is the time to be arguing for the right kind of light at night. Right. Obviously, we need light at night. We've become a twenty four seven society. Sure, but there are there are good ways to do it, and there are some really bad ways to do it. That's too. right, and I don't think anybody's arguing for no street lights, but there is, like you said, a way to do it. And fixtures you buy, and and the cost savings on these uh, on on these fixtures are also the driving factor. So you're right. If you don't have them now, you will have them in the next few years. So. Uh, definitely something to get involved in, and you can get involved with. Well, you know, you can you can get involved in your community uh, government and and make sure that they know uh, what what they're doing with respect to these with these light fixtures. I, we, I only have five minutes left with you, Kelly, and I just want to get your thoughts on one more thing that's in the news this week that I'm I'm finding myself conflicted on. Do you know much about what's happening in Hawaii right now with the uh, thirty yes. meter telescope? Are you familiar with that story? Yes, that there are. Uh, plans to build the 30 meter telescope. Uh, it's a consortium of, of, of professional organizations. This will be a professional ground based observatory located on top of Mauna Kea, which is many consider which are considered by Hawaiians to be a sacred place. And there's a lot of protesters uh, protesting going on to stop this project because it was supposed to begin this week. What do you, do you have any thoughts on that um, dilemma? Uh, well, it's a it's a delicate. Uh, uh, process and and to its credit, the thirty meter telescope corporation has been very um, sensitive to these protests. They haven't come in and strong armed them off the mountain. They've actually stopped work on the telescope. Uh, the, it's not the first time that's happened. Right. That that said, you know this go ahead for construction is the end of a of a very long process involving all the stakeholders including the native hawaiians there are cultural uh, uh councils there have been environmental surveys done there have been ethnological surveys done for example there was there was a a, a claim that there were a lot of uh burial mounds people were actually buried on mauna kea and that they would be uh, you know, d those burial sites would be disturbed. Well, they sent archaeologists up there to check and they, they haven't found any. Um, and it's all, it's not an all or nothing thing. A lot of Hawaiians do appreciate the value that uh, astronomical uh, uh, these observatories bring in terms of improving the economy of the island of Hawaii. So I think, you know, I, 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 I hate to pick a side here, but as I said, this is a process that has played out, and and to the extent that that uh, a high authority in in the government, you know, the the granting um, 
uh, agencies in Hawaii have given the go ahead, that's not going to make everybody happy. And it clearly has not made a, a, a segment of the native Hawaiians happy. But that's why you invest in these agencies to make those decisions, to hear everybody out and come down and, on one side or the other. And if, if every time a decision were made that you disagreed with, you went out and started protests, and we often see that, right? We see that sometimes, for example, in, in whether or not to prosecute a policeman who shot a, 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 you know, a person uh, uh, wrongfully. And then that a policeman is ultimately acquitted because they went through the proper procedures. People are going to be unhappy. I see that going on here. I sure hope it has a, a successful uh, uh, resolution. I just got back from seeing a total solar eclipse in the country of Chile and South America. Oh, you were there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and you know what? Um, many professional observatories, especially uh, those outside the United States, are moving their equipment to South America in instead of Hawaii because there's a limit to the to the domes that can be placed on top of Mauna Kea and it's it's a lot of work to get uh, author uh, to get the approval uh, through in Hawaii and it's not nearly so much work in in Chile so no in I, fact I they're they're embracing it in a big way they 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 advertise I see at professional society meetings I see them with booths you know advertising yeah. their dark skies bring your observatory to Chile right and so I you know I hope this works out to everyone's satisfaction or at least uh, reach a consensus um, I, I I think that the the professional astronomical community has in the past uh, been not as sensitive as they need to be now and they yeah. I think they are that now. Uh, I've seen video of like professional astronomers going out and talking to the protesters, you know, and trying to reach a, an understanding uh, of one another, at least being respectful and, and listening to their point of view. We'll, yeah. we'll see how it plays out. This is not over yet. Yeah. And I think that, uh, thank you. And I, and I think that, uh, you're right, this isn't over, but I also have heard many comments recently as the protests have grown that this isn't just about a telescope. In fact, I, I, I start to, th they're, they're saying it isn't about the telescope at all. It's about the way that which they don't feel listened to as a culture. And so that's a slightly different issue. And I think that this is a symptom or a, a symptom of a much greater problem that of which the TMT is kind of caught into right. but i agree that they have i think been quite sensitive to the issue they've they've tried throughout the negotiations to provide uh you know feedback to the community as well as resources to the community in the form of stem education and money that way so i think i think they're trying and i think they're sensitive to it and i do hope it gets resolved because a 30 meter telescope is a very important future for ground-based astronomy and their plan b is to go to tenerife or to the canary right. islands and so uh maybe they'll, they'll that's another good spot uh uh, for building telescopes, nice high and dry place like Chile. So, okay, well, thank you, Kelly. All right, we're out of time, and I just want to ask one more question from Andrew Planet because it's right here in front of me, and then we'll go. Why do the street light? Why do we have street lights without reflectors? It seems criminal to lose all that light to places where it's not needed, wasted energy. That's right. There's uh, there are light fixtures that shine up into the sky. Right. <laughs> that, that's it? right. And, and you know there there are fewer. Andrew, there are fewer and fewer of those now. Uh, if you go to any modern development, you'll see that actually the, the lighting, not only on the streets, but on parking lots, and, and is, is much more intelligently placed because uh, there's an, uh, an, an economic uh, argument for not sending light into the sky. People want to save electricity. And also, I think that the work of the IDA has, has been, has been you know, mm -hmm. heard. We're, we're starting to be heard and, and listened to. The American Medical Association certainly weighed in. So, yes, there are still those lights. In, the, the problem is that in most cases, there are neither regulations to control them or the regulations that exist allow these older lights to be grandfathered in. Uh, and not actually replaced outright. Yeah. I think those will change over time. I think we'll see we'll see better lighting um, uh, and more intelligently designed lighting. But it's you know this problem with light pollution has taken decades to get this bad, and it's going to take decades to make it better. Yeah, be a great topic for a standalone uh, program. It would. We uh, should come back and do this. So any chance I can get you to come back? <laughs> I'm going to put yeah, you on the spot in front of everybody. I can talk light pollution <laughs> until you know. 
the well, cows come home. Uh, that sounds like the topic of a net of the next uh, telescope talk for sure. Uh, so just a quick comment: Superluminal saying it's getting to the point where light pollution filters don't work since the whole spectrum is becoming polluted. I need like right. a three nanometer H alpha filter to get anything me meaningful here. Right. Uh, right. So, uh, and he's also said I'm taking a thirty minute total exposure of Andromeda. I got almost nothing. So yes, right. is what the filters are another thing I wanted to talk about, but we could get to that maybe another time. Um, okay. okay, well, thank you, Kelly, for taking time out. We're out of time but uh that was my guest today was kelly Beatty, a senior editor at sky and telescope magazine a if you for some reason don't know what sky and telescope is go find out go to sky and 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 re learn about it sign up for a, a subscription because you will not regret it it is a great magazine and if you care about what's up in sky even if you don't own the telescope you will get a lot out of the hobby and what the information that's in that magazine contains i've grown up with it uh, my entire life so i can't say enough good things about it Okay, so on behalf of Kelly Beatty, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank you guys all for watching me. And we'll be back next week where I think I'm talking about exoplanets, another topic I wanted to talk with Kelly, but didn't get a chance to. Uh, so <laughs> we'll talk about exoplanets with the Exoplanets channel uh, on YouTube. So thank you so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up.